about 602, so we'll start introductions. And again, just if you're coming in, welcome to OHIA Love Fest 2022. So grateful to all of you for joining us this evening to celebrate our wonderful native endemic, state endemic tree, uh, Metrosideros polymorpha, more lovingly known as Ohia Lehua. And tonight we have a very special guest who's taking some time out of her schedule, Corey Yanger. And she made sure to uh, want to warn everyone that she is a working mother. Uh, so she might be interrupted a little bit tonight. So I hope we'll, you all have patience if she has some interruptions tonight as she's giving her presentation. But she has some amazing information to share. So we're so excited to have her. I'm going to introduce my team real quick. I'm Franny Brewer. I'm the acting program manager for the Big Island Invasive Species Committee. And I'm joined uh, by my support team, Jade Miyashiro, who's handling our tech tonight, and the plant pono coordinator for the island, uh, Molly Murphy, who's also here to um, check out everything that you're going to put in the chat so she can pass those questions along to our guests. And also, if you have questions about plants, native plants, where, where to find them, what to plant, then uh, Molly's your go-to, so she can answer those questions as well. So, Without much further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Corey Yanger. She is coming to us tonight from Volcano. Um, she has been working with, with Rapid Ohia Death and Ohia for many years now. Right now, she likes to share that she's trying to improve in Kilo, which is observation skills, observing winds, clouds, weather patterns, and moon phases. She has a bachelor's in biological aspect, aspects of conservation from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and she has a master's in tropical conservation biology and environmental science from UH Hilo. She currently is conducting research on forest restoration with the USGS Pacific Island Ecosystems Research Center. And we've all worked with Corey for many years um, on Ohia and uh, Rapid Ohia Death because she was the outreach person for CTAR on this topic for many years. So Corey has a deep and lasting background in um, Ohia science. So Corey, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Welcome, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thanks for that introduction, Franny. Um, okay, I'm gonna share my screen here. And if folks could let me know if you can see this. Looks good. Thank you. Perfect. Okay. Aloha mai kako. Oh, Cory Yanger koui noa no ka ohao mayao no alma kawale amakmoko upuna. Aloha everyone, I'm Corey Yanger, and I am originally from Ka'ohau on the island of Oahu. Many of you may know this place as Lanikai over on the east side. And I currently sit in the Ahupua'a of Kahawalea in the um, uh, district of Puna <clears throat> on the slopes of Kilauea on the island of Hawaii. I'm really excited to be here today and thank you to Franny and the other organizers of the festival this year uh, for carrying on this annual, what I hope is a tradition now. Um, currently I work for the Hawaii Cooperative Studies Unit. This is a partnership between UH Hilo and federal agencies and the agency that I represent is the US Geological Survey, Pacific Island Ecosystems Research Center based out of Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. <clears throat> I'm here presenting on behalf of a team led by Dr. Stephanie Yelenik, who um, used to work for the U.S. Geolo Geological Survey, and for years we were working alongside um, some other folks who I will recognize, Jonah Kuaharahu, Jeff Stallman, and Kyle Roy. Our team was working to understand Ohia seedling survival and growth at rapid Ohia death impacted sites on the island of Hawaii. And the main message of my presentation, if you walk away with nothing else, is yes, go plant them. Um, but we wanted to take this opportunity for um, to take you all on this journey of learning with us as we step back in through the timeline of the project. So I hope you enjoy this talk. First, I want to say mahalo nui to the Aina and the partners and community members who hosted us and and devoted their time and energy resources to making this project happen. It was a community effort, without a doubt. Our work took place in multiple moku on the island of Hawaii. They included Hawaii Volcanoes National Park in the Ahupua'a of Kapapala in the moku of Kau, Keokaha Military Reservation in the Ahupua'a of Waiakea in Hilo, Waiakea Forest Reserve 
also in the Ahupua of Waiakea in the Moko of Hilo. Anne Brooke was one of our community partners and she resides in Kaiviki in Hilo. And last but not least, we had a partner through the Hawaii State Parks, Bojack Key, who assisted us with access to Kalopa State Park in um, the Moku of Hamakua. But also like to acknowledge and recognize uh, many volunteers who helped to collect this data, as well as Dan Mikros, Ellen Dunkel, for many hours um, helping to monitor and keep track of our carrot baiting um, in the lab, which I will explain soon. Um, Eileen Ye helped to watch over seedlings at various points. Big Island Invasive Species Committee, um, who you've already heard from, they have helped us with setting up our experiments and removing our experimental materials from sites. The USDA folks helped with various aspects of our lab work. Chuck Camara of Hawaii Invasive Species Council devoted a lot of his time to helping to monitor seedlings at Kalopa, which is very far from our office in Volcano. And finally, Brian Tucker from Cooperative Studies Unit, Pacific Cooperative Studies Unit, uh, helped us gain access to the ROD working group um, database for one of the maps that I'll show you soon. Uh, because this is Ohia Love Fest, I thought I would start off because I figure many people are thinking about this and celebrating Ohia, thinking about your own connection, your own pilina to Ohia. And my connection to Ohia didn't start until I was um, an undergraduate at university, I didn't know Ohia existed um, until then. I was born on Oahu. I grew up there for a time and then moved to Wisconsin and returned in university studies to help with um, a project in Haleakala National Park in the wet forest. And eventually I became employed by the National Park Service and was very fortunate to learn about Ohia forests, learn about Ohia's importance, and to camp in, hike in, um, and work within Ohia Forest. So the bottom middle picture is me talking to some National Park Service staff. We're talking about some monitoring methods in Kipuhulu Valley on Maui. And the bottom right photo is um, I'm standing on the edge of a very deep valley on the island of Molokai. Uh, there was a time in my life, a period of time when I was practicing hula. I was part of a wonderful halal called Kalehua Kie Kie Ikaiu. Translated, that means majestic lehua in the heights. And we were fortunate at that time to be uh, dancing when we could uh, collect ohia, the liko, and the lehua without fear of introducing the fungal pathogens that cause rapid ohia death. So you can see us dancing. This is one of the festivals at Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. Um, and we're wearing lepo <clears throat> with ohia. Um, my more recent experience with ohia has been, as Franny mentioned, um, the education and outreach specialist for rapid ohia death with the University of Hawaii's Cooperative Extension Service. I worked on that from 2016 to 2020. And um, through that, uh, grew my ohana. Uh, you can see my daughter in the top left picture. She is at one of the Ohia Love Festivals holding her beeswax wrap printed with lehua, and she has lehua painted on her forehead. <clears throat> uh, when I went to go visit schools at that time, sometimes I would take this board, this tree, and I would ask students to cut out uh, their handprints and write why ohia are important to them. And we would stand back and talk about the various ways that they are connected to this important tree. And then the last photo that I have is again of my daughter and she's standing in the base of Kilauea Iki where we um, frequently hike and she has a particular tree that she's really fond of. And so I had to take a picture of her when, she, when we go on that hike. And um, it's been really great to grow my own relationship, my own pilina to Ohia over the years and now through my ohana I get to see their relationships and their pilina to ohia grow as well. <clears throat> so ohia aside from knowing about this uh, as a representation of our magnificent tree in the islands, uh, the word ohia can be broken down further um, in different ways and I've just put up a few of those ways here. These definitions come from the Pukui Hawaiian Language Dictionary. Uh, first, I have O, which is to pierce, to flash as lightning, 
Hia to make fire to form a network. And it is also the needle used to make fishing nets. And then ohi to gather, collect. And when we think about ohia in its structure and the various forms that it can take, um, we start to see these connections of these, these meanings. For me, I think about ohia um, in, the, in full bloom in the sunlight. And that reminds me of this flashing or lightning. The wood is very strong and can be used to make o-o bars um, to pierce into the soil and dig. Um, <clears throat> When I think about ohia seeds, I think of this needle and that, that similar shape to the needle used to make the fishing nets. And then um, ohi to gather. And we know ohia as a water gatherer and then also as one that shelters other plants and animals. So these are some of the, some of the definitions that we can use when we think about ohia. I like to imagine sometimes um, being among those first people who stepped foot on the islands, you know, coming off of the va'a and um, stepping onto the sand and and then what's the next step you're gonna be exploring. So you would be exploring from the kai to the summits of the mountains and you would see this plant everywhere as you're trying to understand the terrain, as you're taking in all of the, the different um, vegetation types, um, these different communities and mixtures of plants here and everywhere from the from the kai to the mountain summits or close to the mountain summits, you would see this tree and recognize that ohia is my o a o. I love this phrase, all around everywhere. And, and ohia truly is. And we're really fortunate on Hawaii Island to be able to experience that my o a o. And through that journey, you would have observed the ohia growing on these um, newly cooled lava flows. So those seeds are gonna sprout in those crevices in the lava, and they're going to be breaking up the rock with their roots, and they're gonna be dropping uh, leaves and um, increasing that litter layer on the ground. And eventually those little trees, those little seedlings will become the canopy trees. And um, this is an, a unique thing, I think, for Hawaii, where you have this tree that exists in early succession as well as later successional phases of the forest, um, whereas on the continental U.S. you would see trees phased out over time, and Hawaii, um, Ohia is one of those that, that stays, it sticks around. And through that growth, it expands those branches, and um, many of those uh, surfaces become perfect locations for bryophytes and seedlings to establish. And through that increased surface area, we have more water capture that here acts as a sponge. And many of you have heard all of this already, but I just like to bring it up again because it's so important. And, um, you know, the Ohia forests are creating vast areas of habitat for our native fauna, insects, and honey creepers. And then the lehua directly provide a food source through their nectar. Um, through all of this observation, it is then no wonder how Ohia came to be celebrated through the Mo'olelo Oli Mele and Hula in Hawaii, the stories and the chants, the songs and the dances. And that elevated level of importance, they also hold through the use in ceremonial structures through ki'i, carved idols or images, um, Kino Lao, the physical representation of multiple deities in um, Hawaiian culture, as well as references to warriors and experts as Lehua. So with this um, ecological and cultural importance of Ohia, then with rapid Ohia death coming on the scene, all of these things are brought to the forefronts of our minds this rapid ohia death caused by two introduced fungal pathogens, Ceratocystis huliohia and Ceratocystis leucoohia, that can cause very high levels of tree death, ohia tree death in our forests. And we've seen this across the state and perhaps nowhere more than ohia, um, Hawaii Island. And with this concern of rapid ohia death and <clears throat> so many trees dying, both researchers and managers and community members, of course, have been um, wondering how can these important forests be restored? How do we approach that? And that's where our team has come in to help answer this question. 
And so this is where our journey begins. The problem is rapid ohia death. And the question um, is, how do we restore the forests? And we're gonna break this question down into, into smaller questions, um, which we'll get to in a moment. And then we're gonna talk about how do we explore the question? How do we, um, what methods do we use to explore the question or questions? And what does our data tell us or not tell us um, with regards to those questions? And finally, we're gonna reflect on why does all of this matter? Restoration, we can think of in two broad approaches. There's um, what we call, or what we're going to call, a wait and see, um, which is this passive restoration, where we will be removing whatever is damaging or stressing the system, the forest in this case, and hope for the best, meaning that we're hoping for natural regeneration to occur. In Hawaii, we have a history of um, human impacts as well as introduced ungulates, um, impacts. And so in when we're talking about removing the, the damaging or stressing factors, we're talking about fencing and keeping ungulates out, and that would have to be sustained over time. And then, of course, hoping that um, in areas where there is a seed bank and good conditions, environmental conditions, that native plants will be able to reestablish in the area. It is pricey, and we expect that areas that have been significantly changed through these activities will be less likely to um, show that natural recruitment. So the second approach is, we're gonna call it more oomph. Uh, this is active restoration, where you do everything that you did for the wait and see method, um, and then add on to that planting in desired species and maintaining weeds in the long-term. And this is a very costly, um, endeavor and effort. We of course have particular restoration challenges in Hawaii. We have, as I mentioned before, the um, introduced feral ungulates, which are able to directly and indirectly impact ohia forests. So they will indirectly impact forests by um, uh, disturbing soils and um, <clears throat> causing erosion in the forest, they're disturbing the soils in a way that will disrupt the ability of native seedlings to establish. And then they will have direct impacts by consuming the seedlings and um, stripping bark off of trees. And that is a major concern given how rapid ohia death or the fungi that cause rapid ohia death can enter into trees through wounds. And on the right hand side of the photos, you see a hand, it is next to a ohia seedling and surrounding that ohia seedling are many introduced non-native and invasive plants. And these plants are able to capitalize on the light and nutrients available in our forests and often outcompete our native plants. Um, and this leads to a, a two-fold issue in the forests. Um, there's a potential that ohia can be disturbed through the presence of feral ungulates. And then with the loss of ohia from the canopy with rapid ohia death, um, there's a chance that natural regeneration will be um, uh, prevented because of the, the spread and pre prevalence of the invasive plants here. We know that rapid ohia death has been confirmed across much of the distribution of Hawaii Island at this point. And so then we have to consider which of the approaches, the wait and see or the more oomph um, approaches would be practical in different areas given the presence of rapid ohia death. So in Kohala, for example, in the north part of the island, there is native forest that with native understory, native canopy. And so trees lost to rapid ohia death in that area, perhaps the forest would be able to naturally regenerate. So maybe the wait and see would be um, uh, possible in that space. Whereas over on the east side in Puna, there are many invasive species in the understory as well as the canopy. And so the uh, more oomph, more energy, more resources, more time, and that long-term sustained effort would be likely um, needed there. So with this you know, prevalence and the threat of rapid ohia death, um, we've heard over the years, why bother planting ohia? Won't they just die anyway? And 
won't that especially be the case in soil in areas where the soils have rod and these are valid absolutely valid questions and so our team um, came up with some questions to investigate and get to the bottom of of this sentiment so the questions that we have for our study include can ceratocystis live in the soil can we verify that it's there and growing able to live if we want if we plant ohia seedlings into the ground how many will die from ceratocystis and then um, how does the rod induce death for the seedlings compared to death from other factors like damage direct or indirect from feral ungulates and then competition from invasive plants so those were our questions and our methods we're going to start with the study sites. So we have five study sites scattered across the east side of Hawaii Island, as far north as Kalopa State Park on the Hamakua Coast, and as far south as Mauna Loa within Hawaii Volcanoes National Park at slightly higher elevation. And we were able to um, confirm with um, some data, oops, sorry, some data from the Rapid Ohia Death uh, Working Group database that um, our sites have Rapid Ohia Death confirmed within or very near to where they happened. Now we'll get into the experimental design at three of our sites. These three sites shared um, a similar design. Those include Keokaha Military Reservation, which I will refer to as KMR. This is a site uh, between Hilo Bay and the Hilo International Airport, and it is a lowland invaded forest with some scattered ohia in the canopy. The um, second site is Waiakea Forest Reserve. The forest is dominated by ohia and um, with many invasive species in the understory and a lot of strawberry guava as well. And the third site is Kalopa State Park. This is a forest with very large old growth ohia and a mixture of introduced species, um, uh, non-native, non invasive as well as invasive species in the canopy and the understory. And these three sites varied in their level of very in their level of rainfall each year with Kalopa State Park receiving the least amount of rain per year. We're going <clears> to <throat> show you the experimental design through our first site KMR. On the picture on the left, you can see in the foreground are some mango trees. As I said before, there are um, various uh, planted, introduced um, uh, tree species in this in this location, and then in the background, hopefully you can see some of the ohia with canopy intact, and then some with um, that are dead standing trees. And then the photo on the right is showing someone planting uh, the ohia seedlings into the ground and what that looked like. So slightly open, um, but that changed rapidly within the course of this study. On the right hand side, I'm representing a couple of ohia trees. What we did was we went in and identified trees that were um, infected with rapid ohia death. So we found those trees, tested them to be sure that they were infected, and then we planted seedlings around them. It was six seedlings per tree, and we maintained weeding around half of those seedlings and fenced half of the trees. So for about every fenced true one tree, we had an unfenced tree as well. At KMR, we confirmed 20 adult trees, and we um, tested those trees using genetic methods as well as carrot baiting, which I'll describe in a minute. And we visited these trees every month for two years. And that consisted of us going in to um, really examine the seedlings and assess their level of health, and also make note of other things that might be impacting them, such as herbivory by insects or slugs. And when we encountered dead seedlings, we would um, take them out of the field and test them using carrot baiting. Uh, the other information that we collected, on the left-hand side, you can see a seedling that um, has mostly litter around it. And that was a seedling that was weeded. On the right is a seedling that was not weeded. And annually, we would collect data on the vegetation cover around these seedlings. So you can um, hopefully really see on the right-hand side with that ohia in the center circled that uh, the invasive species really came in strong for the seedlings that were not weeded. Carrot baiting is basically making a carrot sandwich, or one of my coworkers like to say it's like making a musubi out of carrots um, and ohia in the middle. 
So the left hand photo is showing um, larger pieces of ohia. We were working with twigs of ohia. So picture uh, stems that were no wider than about half of a centimeter. And we would take these um, prepared twigs and put them between two pieces of carrot and then wrap it up and put it in a Ziploc bag and monitor it. Um, if there was viable ceratocystis, it would grow into the carrot and look like that bottom center picture, black staining. And under the microscope, when you really zoom in, the staining would have looked like um, the picture on the right, where it looks sort of like upside down baby bulb syringes. And um, at the tips of those spikes, you can see like a glob of sticky spores. At Waiakea Forest Reserve, um, you can get an idea of the, the site through the picture on the left. It was a lot of uluhe and then melastomes. Um, and the, the canopy in the background, you can see a lot of standing dead ohia. This was one of the worst hit sites, um, considered one of the worst hit sites with rapid ohia death. And uh, this is the fencing installation around the seedlings to protect them from ungulate damage. The picture in the center is me with a seedling at almost two years. So the seedlings started at about 20 centimeters tall on average. Um, so about a foot and a half and they um, grew a, a lot in this site. And you can see that in the picture. On the far right is a picture of a couple of Ohia seedlings naturally recruited within the site. We had a total of 23 trees and 138 seedlings at this in this area. At Kalopa State Park, for perspective, you can look at the picture on the left. This is old growth Ohia forest. Unfortunately, some of those big, big trees did um, succumb to rapid Ohia death. And we were establishing our experimental sites within the forest. The picture on the left is showing the more open um, mowed grass uh, park area. And then the center picture is uh, the denser forest where we were working. And the understory was a mixture of non-native species and native species, a lot of native fern, polypoli. In the subcanopy, it was mostly a mixture of non-native and some native species, colea and um, copico. And the canopy was mostly ohia. The right-hand photo is showing an ohia seedling within the fenced area. And so um, to go back to those questions that I was mentioning before, can ceratocystis live in the soil? That was the first question. To collect, uh, to examine this question, we went to each of these dead ohia trees that we um, had planted around and we collected soil from around the base. And we then made more carrot sandwiches in a manner similar to what I described before. And at KMR, there were three soils that tested positive for ceratocystis. One of those had viable spores. At um, Stainback, or um, sorry, that should say Waiakea, Waiakea Forest Reserve, 22 out of 23 soils tested positive for ceratocystis and had viable spores. And at Kalopa, we didn't have any soils test positive for um, ceratocystis. So, I mean, the main message here is that there can be viable ceratocystis in the soil, but there might be a lot of variability depending on our ability to detect the fungus within the soil. Um, depending on the location. The pictures to the right are showing A has the fruiting bodies that I showed you a picture of before. And then to the right of that is visible frost particles. So the frost particles are the excrement, woody and otherwise from the insects, uh, the, the beetles, the boring beetles, ambrosia beetles that have been associated with um, the spread of rapid ohia death. So <clears throat> it's a close up of those frost particles. Um, and so what did we find at these three um, sites where we were seeing where we had the similar experimental um, setup? In the on the left hand side, you can see the site name center is the number of trees we planted summarized and then on the right hand side, the number of seedlings that died by the end of two years. And KMR and Kalopa had higher levels of seedling death, over 50%, whereas Waiakea uh, had 15 out of 138 seedlings die. So these sites were quite different. A KMR ha, um, 
had a lot of invasive species, a lot of invasive plants in the understory. Those um, non-native plants were growing very rapidly. And so weeding was very important in that area. And um, at Waiakea, there were also many weeds, um, but interestingly, we had very high survival there. Uh, <clears throat> and at Kalopa, there was a surprising amount of seedling death and um, the seedlings were planted in, in the somewhat closed canopy of the forest there. So we did wonder whether or not that um, less light availability had an impact on the survival. And all of the seedlings that we collected from the field did not test positive for ceratocystis. So this is incredibly um, exciting and um, positive for, for our investigation. Our other sites included um, Mauna Loa, as I mentioned at the beginning, this is within Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. Our site was a former burned area. You can see the on the left-hand side photo, koa trunks, uh, these koa trees had burned and there was scattered um, live trees remaining, all of which allowed a lot of light to hit the ground and therefore a, a very uh, aggressive comeback of the non-native grasses. And so you see the grasses in the right-hand side photo growing around these ohia seedlings that we planted. We planted 126. 15 out of 126 died by the end of two years. And seven of those went to flower in that time. And one, at least one individual went to seed as well. And here there were no positives for ceratocystis again. And our last site, Kaiviki and Hilo, was an uluhe field with um, a mixture of non-native grasses growing in among the uluhe. And you can see in the photo on the right is a seedling that we planted into the uluhe that we cleared back. We planted 79 ohia seedlings. Seven out of 79 died by the end of two years. Four flowered within the two years. And at this site also, like Mauna Loa, we had an individual go to seed. And none of these seedlings tested positive for ceratocystis. So um, we were very surprised as well with these, um, these carrot baits turning up without um, ceratocystis. And so that just signals to us that perhaps there are many other things killing the ohia seedlings um, uh, aside from rapid ohia death. So rapid ohia death is not as much of a concern when we're thinking about the seedlings. <clears throat> Uh, here is a um, some summarized data again of the the seedlings in by site on the left hand side the percentage that died the average growth and um, the number of individuals that flowered this is all preliminary data I need to um, uh, say so uh, take all of this with um, some caution. But um, overall, for the percentage that died, again, we had very high survivorship at KMR, Kalopa, um, and, um, um, excuse me, percentage that died was low for Waiakea and Mauna Loa and Kaiviki, and higher for KMR and Kalopa. And similarly, with the areas that had higher death, we also had lower average growth. So KMR and Kalopa had less than 10 centimeter per year growth, whereas Waiakea, Mauna Loa, and Kaviki saw over 40 centimeters of growth um, per year, which is fantastic. And um, at two of those sites, Mauna Loa and Kaviki and Hilo, we um, observed individuals going to flower. <clears throat> Here, we're going back to those three sites that shared their experimental design, KMR, Waiakea, and Kalopa. You can see, again, the percentage of seedlings that died, and then across the top, the different treatments. And um, there was a control treatment, so unfenced and unweeded, only fenced, only weeded, and then a combination of the two. And the um, arrows indicate where the, um, what we found from the data was that these treatments either increased or um, decreased the level of seedling death. So at KMR, weeding seemed to make more of a difference for reducing that seedling death, which was not surprising given that um, there were so much 
so many invasive plants in the understory and, and how quickly they grew. At Waiakea, fencing and also Kalapa fencing seem to make more of a difference in lowering that seed death, seedling death. So um, you've been on the journey of how we did this and now what did we learn? We learned that live ceratocystis can be detected in soils, likely from the beetle frost that you saw the picture of before. And we have, um, we know that planted seedlings can live at least two years, even in infected soils. And natural recruit, naturally recruiting seedlings um, can live in infected soils as well, and will recruit in areas that have impact, been impacted by rapid ohia death. And what can we say from all of these things that we've learned? Um, we we are saying that successful restoration planting of ohia is possible in areas with rapid ohia death. And that um, there are other factors at work that could lead to um, less seedling survival, or lower seedling survival. Those include competition from non-native plants, as well as damage from feral ungulates. And our data also left us with questions, questions about whether or not some set whether or not some sites maybe were too shady, such as Kalopa, and whether or not we might have had different results with higher quality seedlings. Many of our seedlings were donated, um, which uh, may or may have not worked out well in terms of the seedling survival. For one of our sites, Kalopa, for example, seedlings were the seed source was located farther from the site. And then we also run into issues with restoration projects where sometimes the, um, the greenhouse grown seedlings are not ready at the same time as the site is ready for planting or vice versa. So um, there is a timing issue involved in that as well. But why does all of this matter? So this is our reflection time, um, given all of the all of the um, data collection and our interpretation of it. What does this mean? Um, for us, this means that our well understood management tools are still the most effective in protecting our ohia. Those include fencing and managing invasive plants, and of course, not wounding ohia, as we know that wounding is how the ceratocystis fungi enter into the trees. We need to um, improve our understanding of the effect of seed source. And um, so this study has helped us to understand where we need to um, pursue further exploration of some of these questions. And also um, perhaps opening gaps in the canopy by removing invasive trees may help plantings um, by allowing more light to enter into these spaces and um, <clears throat> make conditions, improve conditions for the ohia seedlings. And the main um, message of my talk, of course, planting ohia is not a lost cause. And we know this because we saw these, these seedlings grow fast in some instances in a very short amount of time. Two years of monitoring is really not much. Ideally, these would be tracked for a longer period of time. But within those two years, we saw high levels of survival um, and even flowering and going to seed in some cases. And that's um, really heartening because it means that even within a couple of years, you know, you plant an ohia seedling in the ground and you can see that ohia seedling helped to contribute to the next generation of ohia. And that is um, definitely not a lost cause. So go plant them. This is a picture of um, a teacher that I worked with when I was doing rapid ohia death outreach. We were propagating ohia together over the over a few years, and the last time that I visited, she brought um, seedlings that were uh, one year old, two year olds, and three year old. Um, and so, I think of her when I think of what we're finding. Thank you very much, and I'll take questions. Uh, we had one question in the chat. Um, have any varieties of ohia been have been shown to be more resistant to rot than others? Some varieties. Um, I believe so. I don't know that I'm the best person to answer this question at the moment because I'm not directly involved in um, the resistance trials, but we have a whole 
Um, the Rapido Hedith Working Group has a whole um, group of researchers looking at uh, different varieties and different species of Metrosideros. And um, from my understanding, yes, they are seeing differences in uh, different varieties. That's great. And thank you so much, Corey. That was a great presentation. Um, really appreciate it. Um, if any fo if folks have any more questions, please put them in the chat. Molly, did we have anything over on Facebook? No? Okay. Nope, nothing on Facebook. Um, I want to say I was so excited because um, I live here in Pune in Mountain View, and it's a highly impacted area. My backyard, unfortunately, is a highly impacted area for invasive species. My team gets to hear about my battles with all my nemesis plants. But um, I was just sharing with them that I found a volunteer ohia for the first time in 17 years in my yard. And I stared at it for a really long time because I thought, what is that? <laughs> I could just, my brain could not comprehend that finally something that showed up in my yard was something I desired and not some crazy weed. Like I just could not, my brain could not process that it was an ohia. I'm like, I know it's an ohia, but that just doesn't seem possible. But it was really lovely to be here in Pune and in, in such an impacted area. And so now I'm being very careful um, to clear all the weeds. And for me, I think that's the takeaway from this is that, you know, we can even in our own backyards, especially here in Pune, where we have such large, large properties that we do need to be really careful to um, protect those, <laughs> protect those little ones, those little cakey that are growing up in our yards. And is that the, is that kind of the take home message, Corey, for those of us that are <laughs> trying to, <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you, Brian. <laughs> Definitely. Um, the seedlings will survive if you give them the right conditions, right? So make sure it's a it's a seedling in a good condition, of course, as I mentioned before, you know, a pot bound seedling is not going to do as well as a seedling that's the, with the roots are, you know, ready and free. Um, and make sure you pick a place with um, good light exposure and definitely maintain those, you know, keep the weeds back and um, keep them safe from any ungulates that might come by. Yeah, we just had some ungulate damage in the yard last night. So, you know, there's all those things. Um, I oh. have a question, Corey. Did you look at the substrate or think about the substrate that you were planting it in? Were some places had more drainage maybe or? That's a really great point, Molly. And no, we did not look specifically at substrate. We did, of course, you know, see that the substrates were different, um, but no, not explicitly testing. It's a great question to explore next. Oh, so many variables, really difficult questions that you guys, I mean, big questions. People think this is very straightforward, but I think from everything that you're sharing, it really shows how, just to answer what seems to be one simple question, can Ohia survive in an area that's impacted by rod? Just how many pieces you have to look at in order to try and get an answer to that question. And yet there's, you're still left at the end with like, well, what if I, what if we've done this? Or what if we've done that? Or what if, what at this so I mean what great work is the is the project continuing Corey or what are the next steps what's what's happening next with it yes well um all of these sites have been I mean we've completed the two years of monitoring monitoring for each of them and now we're in this transition phase well as I mentioned Stephanie Yelenik is no longer with U.S. Geological um, Survey and so we have a new restoration ecologist um, who is fantastic and we're hoping that she um, and others can have some conversations about um, whether and how to continue this research. Yeah. Well, that's great. BISC is always happy to help. I noticed somebody in the chat, uh, Jessica, is sharing that um, she's about to plant 400 as a part of an NRCS uh, program. So awesome. Uh, any tips for, 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 for uh, Jessica putting in 400 trees, Corey? <laughs> I guess just make sure that the area is free from ungulates when they go in the ground, ideally, and, and trying to keep the weeds back or grasses back, whatever is growing around those seedlings. And yeah, just keep an eye on them and um, hope for the best. Hopefully they have really good growth in those first, first years of establishment. That'd be super great. Uh, yeah, that would be awesome to see. 
Um, okay, so that's about it. Unless anybody else has any questions, we can wrap up and everyone can get on with the rest of Ohia Love Fest week. I know you're all planning many events for this week as we are, um, but I just do want to put in a plug for those of you who are in East Hawaii or on the Big Island. Uh, we are having a live in-person um, celebration on Saturday in Pahoa at the Community Center, um, and we're going to have a lot of researchers there. Um, um, uh, speaking about the various projects and in fact, you know, the question about resistance, we're going to have the resistance team there who's going to be speaking about um, some of the work that they're doing on testing the different uh, varieties of Ohia. So uh, we're going to have games for the kids and giveaways and decontamination kits and stickers that are specially made for just this event and all sorts of things. And we are also going to have raffles uh, giving away prizes and some of the prizes that you could win is in Ohia. But for all of you folks who attended tonight. I'm sorry if you're off island, I won't be able to provide this for you. But if you're on island, um, we'd like to offer you an Ohia tree for your backyard. So if you are interested in picking up your free Ohia tree as a thank you for attending this and learning more about Ohia, please go ahead and you can just write a private note to the hosts um, with your name and your email and we will contact you about your Ohia when you can come pick up your little Ohia seedling so you can help uh, share the Ohia love. Um, Molly, did you have anything you wanted to wrap up with? I mean, they are seedlings, but they're about a foot tall, our little Ohia trees. I just, if people think a seedling, they might think really little, but they're about a foot tall. And, you know, with um, Corey's research, who knows, maybe they're going to flower this year, some of them, because some of them are about two years old. I don't know. I, they're beautiful, beautiful trees. We do get ridiculously excited about Ohia because they're in front of our office. Molly picked them up today and they're in front of our office and everyone's just like smiling, like, look, look at all the Ohia. So it's really exciting. But yeah, please just go ahead and enter that information in if you'd like your Ohia. Like I said, I can't ship them off island. That is not permitted, uh, but we can share those with the folks who are here on the big island. And I wanna thank everybody for coming tonight. Um, and Corey, thank you so much for this presentation and sharing this information uh, with us. We will have a recording of this um, up on Facebook and also um, on our YouTube channel. So if people would tune in there, that would be great. We have lots of great information on YouTube about various invasive species and we appreciate all of your interest and your support in um, this work that we're doing to save our Ohia forests and everything that the Ohia supports, all the wonderful plants and insects and birds that the Ohia support. So thank you very much. Have a, a wonderful evening. Mahalo. Thanks so much, everyone.